Welcome back, everybody. We are here joined with Maya Evans. Welcome to the Masterclass Series. Today, Thank you. We are going to be talking about the conversation surrounding mental health literacy and also just about Maya's background and how she got into this, this area of her field. Now, Maya is a former track and field athlete at the University of South Carolina. She also graduated from Columbia University in New York with a master's of education degree in applied development and school psychology. Maya, you are currently a national certified school psychologist while pursuing her doctorate in clinical psychology at Nova Southern Southeastern University. Mm -hmm. And that's down there in Miami, right? Yeah, Fort Lauderdale, right up the street. Down in Fort Lauderdale, okay. And you also are a fitness trainer and strength and conditioning coach down in that area. So how did you how did you really get into that you know field? What were your early ambitions and motivations that really got you into your career? Yeah, right into it. Let's go. So when I was an athlete and just growing up, um, you know, mental health, as I'm sure maybe you can relate, it was not emphasized within our culture and my community, coming from a very uh, religious background and. I struggled. I struggled in high school with my parents getting a divorce. I struggled going into college, um, moving away from home and not having that support system and just all the stresses that come with being a student athlete. And I just couldn't figure it out. And nobody knew how to help me figure it out. And at that time, sports psychology was really focused on just why can't you perform in your sport? There was no look at the mental health it was emphasized you know how can we get you back to performing like you should and that was often just focusing on in the moment not looking at all those things that have happened in the past so when I felt like I wasn't getting any help I decided that okay well I guess I got to learn this for myself and it was a journey um, to go through grad school in psychology and also healing yourself to learn how to help heal others. And that's honestly what kind of changed my projection. And because coming out of college or going into college, that was not the plan. Me, I was really interested in being a more the physical side of things. So I was looking into anything. I was doing sciences and looking into athletic training and things like that. But um, when I found that I really didn't feel like I couldn't do anything without first getting my mental health in check. And I felt like the only way to do that was to learn for myself. So as a upon senior year is when I added psychology, <laughs> senior year in undergrad was when I added psychology. And um, so that's just how long I went with, I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, and then went to, ended up it worked out, went up to Columbia in New York and got my master's in psychology and then now have decided to pursue my doctorate as well, just so that I have a well-rounded um, understanding and knowledge of not only the child development, but into adulthood and older adult as well. I respect that. And then I see you are a CEO and founder of Mental Muscle, Mental and Muscle. Oh, let's see, let's see. Now, Define that. What is what is your business? What is your, the company that you're running? Yeah, so it combines the mental health and physical health, the everything well being of the individual. Very holistic approach. So I offer right now a lot of it's focused on the children and um, collegiate athletes because that's primarily what my background is and expertise is at this moment. So any services counseling, um, also doing personal training, strength and conditioning. Um, that also includes psychoeducation. So doing talks like this, going to different communities, different teams, different practices. And just that that's, you know, the first introduction that I can give them to mental health and mental performance. And that's what I aim to do. Um, anything involving mental health and physical well-being, talking about nutrition, talking about sleep. Um, right now, that's the focus of my business is that education and knowledge, and then people will be more able to be more <laughs> digestible, just because like, I understand just how I was, um, you know, mental health is it's coming a little bit more, we call it like pop psychology or hashtag psychology. You know, we're talking about it. It's trending, but yeah. people don't really know 
you know, what it means and then also aren't really going beyond the hashtag. I understand that. And for somebody who kind of went through college and high school, I was just very anxious when I played on, on the field. I played football and also ran track. So like when I used to step onto the field, it was it was so nervous for me. You know, I was someone who didn't really have that mental health literacy to really understand my mind. You weren't and, the only one. You weren't the only you know, one. <laughs> like to understand like what what is what is making me so nervous on the football field? You get like the pregame butterflies. And every single time you just, you just think to yourself, don't mess up, don't mess up, don't mess up. Yeah. I had, I had one experience where I was running the 400 meter dash and I didn't really know how to run the race. So I was just like, I'm going to run as fast as I can, just as fast as I can. Yeah. So I took off the blocks. I'm the first person around getting to the 200 mark and I'm looking behind me. There's nobody near me. Right. I get to the 300 and my legs starting to die out. And I get to my last leg and I'm running, I'm running and my legs just give out with like 20 meters left. I just fall and I hit. Wow. Really? Yeah. And <laughs> you it, gave it your all though. I gave it my all, but, <laughs> but it was like in the moment I was sitting there like, what has just happened? You know, I'm like, oh my God, I'm dying inside. Everybody saw it. But for my mental health, it kind of like, it, it took a, you know, a jab at me and I was just like sitting there. It kind of took some confidence away, but. I, I I said, all right, I can't worry about that. You know, the 200 yeah. meter dash was coming up later. I gave my all in that race and I, I came in first place, but it's just, you know, with about That's what you're awesome. They were able to bounce back from that. Cause uh, some people yeah. would be stuck on that other race. Yeah. That's, that's one thing. It's just like, how, how is it that, you know, as an athlete, we don't really like understand, you know, our mental health as those things that can really, you know, propel us forward. Instead, we, we kind of separate that from like our playing on the football field. So it's kind of like, how do you connect that? How do you connect the- Yeah, well, I think it starts with that education of what mental health really is. And that's just under being able to understand the well-being of our thoughts, emotions, and feelings um, that affects, you know, our cognitions, our actions, and how we go about our daily living. And there's often- there is this stigma on mental health and that it equates to mental illness, which is completely different. Mental health is just a general term, just like physical health. You know, when you talk about physical health, it doesn't always mean that there's a negative component to it. It's just you're je talking gen in general terms about how you're doing physically. It's the same thing with mental health is just having these conversations, these check-ins. Um, some teams I know that will check in daily with like a mental health scale, mental wellness scale. Um, but now, and especially when we were in college, those type of things, these are just new things that are coming now because people are understanding the importance of the athlete's mental well-being, if not more so than their physical because at the end of the day, you can be this extremely talented, extremely physically hardworking, strong athlete. But if you don't know how to control your performance anxiety or all the other things that are going on mentally, you can't execute. And I think it's finally starting to people finally starting to understand that. Um, but we didn't have that knowledge, which I think is the first knowledge and awareness of it. And then getting into kind of where me as a psychologist likes to understand is where that performance anxiety is coming from, um, from maybe it's, you know, as a kid, you were expected to always make straight A's, you're expected to always have this good behavior. And when you made mistakes, you were punished for it. And so that can go into adulthood now where any, you're afraid to make mistakes. You, if you make a mistake, you're what we call ruminating or keeping thinking about it over and over again and it affects your next action um so those things often there are something that developed earlier on and is now a habit and so you have to take the time to explore that and then develop a new habit which is frustrating for athletes and high performers because we want to you know get things right and we want to win and we want to get things done um so when things take a long time 
Um, we understand that application from a physical standpoint, because we understand that, you know, it takes time to build this muscle, takes time to recover. Um, but it's hard to, for some of us to translate that over to the mental side of things, because one, something we can't see the progress on directly, you know, you could start to see if you sprain your ankle and at first you can't walk, you're on crutches. And then you see the progression of, oh, I took the, I don't have to use the crutches anymore. And you get to physically see that. But for mental health, it's a little bit harder when one, you don't have that awareness. And then you also can't directly see it because it's happening inside of you. So that is, for example, if you were extremely depressed in a, in a depressive episode where you can't get out of bed, you aren't um, doing the things that you used to do. And that persists over a couple of weeks. And it's a little bit harder for some people to one, pull themselves out of that because you probably haven't told anybody. Um, People, your friends are just like thinking you're lazy and there's this negative stigma associated with it. So you can't, you don't even know how to begin to improve on that but little things like even just you being able to get out of bed the next day that's a progression but some people you know it don't think of that as one step forward just as when you broke your ankle you were to you were able to take a step and that was progression as well so i think it's just hard for us to make that connection and why um now that athletes are really struggling with that and there's even more talk about it now, like I said, in this pop culture, pop psychology, but it's still not as much of that education and um, mental awareness and mental health of that. Okay. Now, what are some ways that these athletes and just the normal human being can deal with anxiety? To really yeah. Take- so first, let me <laughs> define anxiety. So anxiety is a worry or fear or uneasiness of something that's going to happen. And it's often that that uneasiness or fear is not as big as the actual event or thing that's going to happen. Um, And I also want to say that that's different from a diagnosis of an anxiety disorder. Um, People can have anxious symptoms, which is a normal reaction, the car is a common reaction to um, some type of stress or something going on or pers- previous event that has made them feel anxious about a, a upcoming event. But that disorder is when, and I think lines get blurred is a disorder is a, it's a defined in the diagnostic manual that it's, you know, six months of this persistent anxiety and worry and uneasiness. So that's a little bit different than, oh, today I feel anxious about, you know, my race tomorrow, but I'm good the next day. So I think those also, that line also gets a little bit blurred, but find that. And then um, it's different for each person, Um, but for athletes, a general idea or how I approach it is again, looking into where that anxiety comes from. Let's dissect this. We call it Socratic questioning and kind of looking at what is your actual fear and what may actually happen going through different scenarios. What's the worst thing that could happen? And then the outcome from that worst thing and kind of going through it that way. Um, So for example, if you're scared of falling again in your next 400 race, I would talk about, you know, where is that fear coming from? Well, you would say, you know, it just happened in the last race, but how many races did you run before where that didn't happen, you know, and going into that, that side of things of debunking the fear is what I call it. And so you would also um, go through the next race. Well, what if that does happen again? Mm-hmm. And again, you've gone through how many races where it didn't happen? That's only two times where that's happened. And maybe what do you need to do for the next race um, to prepare yourself and increase your endurance to be able to make it to the end before that lactic acid hits? And so just going through scenarios um, like that, I think athletes understand very concrete things. So I feel like that's a that's a way that, works with several athletes is being able to just look at the facts and examine it that way. Um, But also different pre-race or pre-game strategies that can also support you in preparing for that game or race. 
uh, that can make you feel a little bit more confident going in. And that's different for everyone. It could be, I know for myself, it was, I had a specific pair of socks I like to wear, you know, I'd make sure I had what had them washed before every meet. And I have my little routine. I'll get in the ice bath the night before I would go over the race in my head you know, put on my, I use Tiger Balm. I know it's not an icy hat person. I was a Tiger yeah. Balm. And so I would put my Tiger Balm on and then just like really get my mind right. Turning off, you know, social media, turn off my phone, different things like that that can help get your mindset right. But the other That's things my, helps get the mental right. Mental health. I had like my own pregame song that I had to listen to. Every yeah. Time. Yeah. See, it's just time I listen to it. It, like got me, it got me in the zone, you know? Yeah. Really. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> one thing to also say is just like i understand like with now that was talking about track with the sport of football like these different positions certain players they can really get into their heads so like mm -hmm. being a receiver the number one thing that you have to do is, is catch the ball yeah like when you drop a pass or something you're sitting there you can get in your head and you're just like catch the ball next time catch the ball next time and that's yeah. kind of like all you're focusing on is like catch the ball catch the ball catch the ball instead of just pulling yourself back out of that that kind of programming and just really focusing in that moment. So like, just how do you, do you set yourself up for just being in the moment and not really caring about all the, the outside noises, you know, just really focusing on that player, focusing on that, that event that you have, how do you really get yourself set up for that? Yeah. So what that actually looks like may vary per person and what kind of method, but really that mindfulness aspect of being in the moment, that's truly what that, that means is being able to shut out the noise, lock in on what you need to do. And for me and what I often coach my athletes with is being able to first clear your mind and then lock in on that one thing they need to focus on. So we're doing deep breathing techniques that can look a little bit different for everyone. Um, I personally like to inhale through the nose, hold at the top, hold your breath, and then exhale for just a few more seconds longer. And then also assigning, you can positive words for the inhale, maybe something that you wanna get out of your mind. It could be anxiety for the exhale, it's releasing. And it, that's a little bit hard to do, especially for athletes and a lot of people that are constantly on edge. We're constantly having to think of this thing and that. So that can be a little bit hard, just even getting clearing your mind first and ha helping them understand that concept and then going into, OK, when you open your eyes, you know, you're getting get locked in on being a wide receiver. That's what you need to be in this moment. And what that looks like, knowing that you're confident in your abilities to catch the ball, I am focused and I am going to catch the ball, making sure that they're using that positive, not, it, okay, if I catch the ball or if I try to catch the ball, like making sure that it's positive and really can lock in and focus on that and transfer it then into the game. That's something you would do like right before, right as you're warming up making sure that you're focusing in on your on your mindset no definitely i understand that now biggest thing too is like when people get themselves in this rut you know they don't know how to ask for help or they don't want to ask for help yeah. that that's a huge thing so the question would be like as you said you know when people are in these states of being depressed and they, they can't even get out of bed they're not using their support outside of themselves how, mm -hmm. how do you ask for help how do you open the floor up to other people outside of yourselves to really come in and understand you, understand your mind, your body, the really holistic wellness surrounding that? So first you need to recognize, you know, that you need assistance and you can't do it by yourself. A lot of people try to suffer in silence and um, just try to work through, push it away or, you know, work through it on their own. So they also need to understand that you aren't a burden for asking for help. Um, a lot of people also refrain from asking for help because they feel like, you know, this person has a lot on their plate within themselves. Uh, they don't need to be burdened with my things that going on. And so sometimes that just looks like telling someone, you know, how you're feeling right now. Not necessarily, hey, I need help with this, but like, look, I'm really just stuck or I'm, I really haven't been myself. 
and someone that you can trust, someone that it can be anybody. For some people, it's maybe it's your parents. For some, it's your best friend. It's your partner. It's uh, with kids. So maybe it's a teacher. I can't tell you how many teachers have been the first person that a child comes to. Um, and it, you would love for it to be a coach for people to be able to confide in their coach, but it can be some type of staff professional for professional athletes, somebody on the staff, every, every athletic team has to have professionally has to have a psychologist or some type of mental health provider. And just being able to walk in the office and know that you don't have to have it figured out. You don't have to even know what's going on. You just know that you're off, something's off. And mm -hmm. that's how it can start the conversation is it doesn't need to be, oh, I think I have major depressive disorder. You know, I've been, <laughs> I haven't been able to get out of bed for the last two weeks, or I think I have generalized anxiety disorder because I've been anxious for six months. Like it just, you don't have to have that figured out. That's the mental health provider's job, but it's just that you are able to have that awareness of something has been off. I want to talk to someone about it and just go in and start the conversation that way with whoever it may be um that being said it's also important that you know you not only you know how to ask for help but how you know how to respond when someone may ask you for help and understanding your limits there as you are in a mental health provider so you don't have to have the answers either and being able to tell them that um that you know i'm I empathize is the first thing being able to empathize with them but then letting them know, you know, I, I don't know, this is hard. I don't know how to help you solve that, but I'm here to support you in helping you find a solution and being able to get better. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's a great answer right there. Now, I just want to know you getting into this point of your career, you know, your early journey has a pivotal moments that shape the path to success. Could you share some of these moments and how they influence your career? Yeah, I would say being diagnosed with major depressive disorder myself in high school was going and going into college uh, was something that really um, not at that moment sparked my journey to be a psychologist, but was just like a pivotal moment in my mental health journey. And I was on, trying different medications. Um, I was doing therapy and going through that myself was a pivotal moment. Unfortunately, th all that didn't happen until graduate school. Ultimately, you know, it was okay. I went and then uh, I actually, <laughs> when I first went to therapy, I didn't even finish the session. They told me to leave because I was so adverse to it. I was not having it. I would not listen um, and that was, in, that was in high school. Um, and then even again, I was just very, still very skeptical. Cause I grew up thinking, oh, I should just be praying about it. That's all I need to do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so it took me a while, even just internally and unconsciously that I had these just adversities to mental health and therapy. And so being able to work through those through my program and um, I would say another thing would just also not reaching up my full potential in collegiate track. Uh, I was constantly getting injured. Um, I was constantly and that as a, we didn't even talk about athlete injuries, but that's a whole nother <laughs> podcast. Um, but oh. when you when I was injured and then just mentally just feeling inadequate, feeling it, the feelings that I was feeling before just en enhanced when I was injured and never, never got better in collegiate athletes, athletics performance wise. I felt like practice, I would still go out there. But when it came to that performance and having to put it all out there, I wasn't able, I didn't have that knowledge, awareness, ability to apply that. And so I was like, I want to help other people and other athletes be able to perform um, athletically and then for other high, high achieving populations, you know, people in business, helping them to perform in their business, helping others to perform in different aspects of their, of their life. Cause I, it was something, it wasn't something that I was able to do when I was competing as an athlete. I respect that. And just to kind of wrap this up too. Now, this is 
for advice for you know your successful story you really have a great story and what you're doing right now with your career you have your own business and you're doing all the things that you, you want to do in your life now for those who aspire to achieve their own success stories what advice or insights would you offer based on your own journey and experience mm. I would say is something that I said before is turning the things that were painful into things that make you powerful. And those are the things that are unique to you and that, yes, you can get all the education and the training in all these different areas, but you'll be most passionate about the things that have affected you. And so that's where the physical and the mental come in for me. And finding a way to combine both of those because I'm very passionate about both and taking something that you're passionate about and being able to turn that, even if it's, you know, videography and that's something that maybe you don't have a whole story about from your childhood, but using your videography skills to tell a story and highlight different people that have a similar background to you or have an experience that you're passionate about, um, I would say is the best way to stay committed to becoming successful um being successful is takes a lot of different things mentally as well and you can you have to work on yourself as a human before you or even as in at the same time as you are working towards becoming your best self and your career or things like that, you have to really look deep down. Okay. What are some things that may get in the way of my success because they are a human characteristic of mine. For example, for me, one was self-sabotage and something that, you know, when you, you, you stay committed to something and then you give up when things are just about to get good or you, find yourself having trouble comp completing tasks because like you can't get to that very end of the, of the task or the thing. So just little things like that, that may be a characteristic of you as a human that could um, you could work on to enhance your chances for success. And so for some people that also just self-esteem, um, general happiness, and you have to be happiness with within yourself and not just, oh, if I become this career path, then I'll be happy. Um, being able to be, you know, just find happiness through the process of becoming successful. Yes, that's a great way to answer that question. Now, I just want to tell you that it was a pleasure to have you on our show today and on our talk. Thank you so much. And now, I do really you. hope you positive success in your journey going forward. Now, everybody, this is the Masterclass series, and this is Maya Evans. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. You're welcome.